Good evening and good afternoon. This is Vance Hilderman from Effusion, and we'd like to welcome you from many, many countries we see. We have viewers tuned in to this live webinar, one in a series of safety critical optimization. This one with our friends Patrick at Aerospace Pal at Effusion is titled Optimizing DO254 and DO160. With that, let's begin. First, a little introduction about Effusion. If you don't know us already, we are one of the largest service providers of avionics development and certification. Our current staff has provided over 250 avionics projects on site in 35 countries. We believe our services are quite literally in almost all modern aircraft, fighter aircraft, many weapon systems throughout the world. We do DO254 training and outsourcing services along with software systems and safety. We also have what we feel are the world's best, certainly newest DO254 checklist and templates. All new and proprietary, only from a fusion. Our current staff has done more DO254 gap analysis and trainings than all other competitors in the world combined. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to our good friends and partner, Patrick, at Aerospace Pals, who could tell us a little bit about the great work he does with his engineers. Patrick? Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Vance. Um, as CEO of Aerospace Pal, we're a little bit smaller, but no less dedicated to you as test and design engineers in the aerospace field. We're a company created specifically to help engineers pass DU-160. If you come to our site, I encourage you to do, you'll see videos to help you understand the electrical tests being performed, the tools to analyze your design against DO160 requirements, and articles that help educate engineers on DO160 best practices. And thanks, I'll hand it back to you, Vance, uh, to start and run through that checklist or the uh, quiz questions. Oh, very good, indeed. Folks who have not joined us before, you're in for a treat. We like to start our webinars with a little quiz. We engineers worldwide are competitive. We think we're smart. I'll bet you know the answers to all these. If you're not sure or you want to find out, we'll be giving those answers in just 45 minutes at the end of this webinar. We've also tried to time it so we'll have sufficient time to answer a few questions, but we will be done within the hour. First question is development assurance level, DAL, that's the same as level or criticality level. In DO254, is it similar to DAL-C in the software counterpart, DO-178C, true or false? Number two, DO-160 has different testing for complex versus simple hardware, true or false? Number three, DAL-A, complex electronics hardware, CEH, development is often 10% or more more expensive than DAL-B. Number four, see how you're doing. DO254 provides a concise definition of complex versus simple. And how about number five? Hardware testing per DO254 must be repeated for DO160 tests. Number six, true or false? The last question. Hardware synthesis and place and route tools are usually qualified. Hmm, what do you think on that one? Okay, again, we're gonna provide the answers at the end of this webinar. With that, let's dive in and take a look. First, let's look at the design legacy of DO254. We have the planning process, that's outlined in section four. Then we have supporting processes. These are actually more expensive, typically over the lifetime of a project than the actual hardware development itself. We have validation and verification. Is there a difference between validation and verification? People just call it V and V, many times because they don't know the difference between V or V, so they call it V and V. But let's be serious. What is verification validation, which is more important? Well, that's the purpose of this webinar. We're talking about environmental testing, DO160 with Patrick, and we're talking about hardware testing, DO254. Verification, does the hardware implementation meet the hardware requirements, okay? Validation, do we have the right requirements? Right being correct, unambiguous, verifiable, complete. 
Which is more important, FAA, SSA? Yes, they're both important. The reality, probably validation is more important. You need the right requirements first. We'll talk about that. Then we've got configuration management, process assurance or quality assurance on steroids, where it's not simply quality assurance, it's also supplier assessment, production, manufacturing transition, and then certification liaison. Then it's based on the waterfall, but we don't use the waterfall. Requirements capture, conceptual design, detail design, implementation, production transition, a seeming waterfall that we don't quite use in that way. So let's take a look. The history is important. How did DO254 evolve? Well, DO178A kicked it off. That was software. Remember, we didn't have complex, sophisticated hardware per se back in the mid 80s. 178A is based on processes, testing, focus on the components, just four criticality levels, reviews, waterfall methodology, but focus on the components. If we test all the components, surely we'll have a great system. Well, that didn't work so well. So 178B told us about integration, transition criteria, diverse development methods, a focus on data and tools. Then 254, look, eight years later, what is 254 based on? Simple, 178B, not 178A, which means we have integration transition criteria. Apply somewhat similar, but not exact, 178 processes to hardware. However, unlike 178, 254 doesn't have the same objectives or criteria. It's more subjective and variable. Simple reason, why? Hardware is more variable. We have LRUs, circuit card assemblies, programmable logic devices, field programmable gate arrays, application specific integrated circuits. These are all elements of hardware. And then a few years later, what we all live under now, life is not fair. It's different across the Atlantic. We have Advisular Circular 20152. Certification Authority Software Team, number 27. ESA, SWCEH, Certification Memo 001. These clarify DO254, but again, note the divergence. Folks, if you'd like a copy of these, just send us an email. Our email's at the end, and we'll send you a complimentary copy of those particular advisories. Now, moving along, 254. The guidance is applicable to, but not limited to, LRUs, line replaceable unit, the box, separate power, separate cooling, separate I.O. Within the box, the LRU, we have circuit card assemblies, CCA. Then custom microcoded components. Look at the bolding on that. That is a true focus of 254 because the process is important, especially for higher criticality levels, DALs. But we also need to be concerned Fourth from the left, integrated technology components, hybrids, multi-chip modules, system on a chip, multi-core computing. And then we've got commercial off-the-shelf hardware components, components that might have a service history. That doesn't mean usage. It means service history, tracked, formal. And we may not have the intellectual properties on those. Okay. Folks, we're continuing on. I apologize. We need to go back a little bit. Okay. It looks like not everyone was in listen mode. So, Patrick, we're going to kick off with an introduction again. Our apologies. Just real quick, a Fusion is a very large safety critical services company with a lot of DO254 capability processes and checklists. Patrick, you want to give us a quick rundown? of aerospace pals if you don't mind again some of the folks weren't yeah, in listen mode sorry about that that's no problem vance aerospace pal is a, a company created specifically to help design and to test engineers pass do 160. we have videos tools and articles at the website specifically for you to help you pass do 160. very good thanks patrick now our quiz Number one, DAL-C and D254 is similar to DAL-C in 178C. DO160 has different testing for complex versus simple hardware. True or false? We'll provide the answers in just 40 minutes. 
Number three, DAL A development of complex electronics hardware is often 10% or more expensive than DAL B. Number four, DO254 provides a concise definition of complex versus simple. Interesting. Number five, hardware testing per DO254 must be repeated for DO160 tests. True or false? And number six, hardware synthesis and placement route tools are usually qualified. What do you think about those, folks? Well, let's dive in and see. Now, some DO254 key facts. First, the official title, Design Assurance Guidance for Airborne Electronic Hardware. It's developed in 2000, mostly industry personnel, not certification authorities. It's based on DO178B, not DO178A. However, unlike DO178, there's no specific 71 objective criteria like we had for 178. However, DAL A and B are white box, meaning we look inside the box, the design processes, the logic, the actual implementation is carefully evaluated. However, DAL C and D in DO254 is more black box, meaning we don't look inside the box. DO254 is not a strict recipe book. It suggests what to do, but not how. It's part of the avionics development ecosystem, as we call it here at Effusion, including ARP 4754A for systems and 4761 for safety. It has a basic tenet of guilty until proven innocent. We need to prove our innocence via plans and checklists. Now, let's take a look at the design lifecycle. Planning comes first, section four, and then supporting processes, validation of verification. Remember, verification does implementation meet requirements validation and do we have the right correct complete unambiguous verifiable requirements truly folks in our opinion validation is more important you need the good requirements before you can verify them then configuration management process assurance which is quality assurance plus supplier audits manufacturing production transition certification liaison then what looks to be the waterfall but it's not look requirements capture of hardware, conceptual design, detail design, implementation, production transition. The history is very, very important. First, we had DO-178A with a focus on processes, testing components, four criticality levels, reviews and waterfalls, but the key was components. If all the components were correct, then surely the system would be correct. Well, that didn't work. So instead, we had a major upgrade including integration, transition criteria, focus on data diverse development methods and tools. This is what DO254 was based on, okay? So DO254 has integration, transition criteria, different development methods, but there's no specific 71 objectives like we have for software because hardware is vastly different. Hardware encompasses line replaceable units, circuit card assemblies, COTS hardware, PLDs, ASICs, FPGAs, many different types. We'll be talking about those. And then we had some clarifying criteria. Look at the bottom row. Advisory Circular 20152, CAST 27, Certification Authority Software Team. Then EASA, SWCEH, Certification Memo 01. Clarify DO254, but note the divergence between Europe and USA. Now, the scope of 254, it's applicable to LRUs, line replaceable unit. That's the box, separate power, cooling, I.O., but also other hardware inside the box, circuit card assemblies. A real focus on that middle section right there, in bold, custom micro component components. Those have logic similar to software, including the logic in ASICs, PLDs, FPGAs, and then Integrated technology components, hybrids, multi-chip modules, system on a chip, multi-core computers. And then finally, we have COTS, COTS hardware, commercial off the shelf with a service history, with actual service history, meaning formal usage tracking and problem reporting. And we might not have the internal white box intellectual property access to those COTS components. So we need special rules for how we work with those. Then look at the layout. Very similar to 178, the planning process, the development. Development is not just hardware development, it's requirements, it's 
design, conceptual, detailed. Then it's the actual logic implementation or circuit card building. And then that correctness process, VNV, &V, validation verification, CM, process assurance liaison. This is a more appropriate view of the life cycle, the avionics development ecosystem. In the upper left, we have the safety process, safety guidelines, 4761 and the new version A tells us what's the criticality level, development assurance level, what's the architecture, how much redundancy do we need, how reliable is it? That feeds into safety requirements that lead to system requirements, black box, ARP 4754, the guidance for what does the system do? Underneath, we have all of the implementation lifecycle guidelines from DO160 that Patrick's gonna tell you about in just a few minutes, the shake and bake, try to break, we call it. It's the environmental testing. Then software, databases, hardware, and all the rest. Now, DO254 has a conceptual design process. If you're really smart and have a simple design, you might be tempted to jump from hardware requirements to detail design. But ask yourself, are the people verifying your hardware also as smart and capable? How about the people changing it? How about 10 years later when you're no longer there? Well, maybe you need that conceptual design, which is the overlap of requirements and detail design. And in fact, you do. Now, conceptual design, remember, for DAL A through C, we have to capture that hardware design. DAL A and B, we need a standard because we evaluate it. DAL A and B, lives are on the line. People could die with failures. DAL A and B also need a conceptual design and a detailed design. We need to show, remember, guilty until proven innocent, formal transitions from requirements to conceptual design, then from conceptual design to detail design, including our implementation. Now, process assurance only does two things, right? But it's an important two things. Number one, the foundation. Ensure that projects, plans, standards, checklists comply with DO254. Then assess and record the engineer and supplier's conformance to those plans. In theory, folks, in theory, your engineers should not need a copy of DO254. Why? Because all of the relevant objectives for your project, the project they're working on, are codified. That means captured within those five plans and four standards that the engineers are following and that process assurance is auditing to. Then we have the optimal DO254 engineering route. On the top, it's the planning process. On the bottom, it's the development and correctness process. It starts with safety in the upper left to process assurance, develop those system requirements, plans, standards, traceability, implement configuration management, and have our first SOI, somewhat similar to SSR. Then develop those hardware requirements in parallel with conceptual design, detail design, logic, and hardware implementation, SOI2. Then complete the verification and validation, SOI3. And then did your project have any changes? Do those conform? Are you ready for flight testing, SOI4, and certification? Now remember, Remember this, we have ARP 4761 and 54A. Those are the safety regimen. We have to remember that safety regimen is key with a feedback loop. Safety assessment, upper left, what's the architecture? What's the criticality level? System development, system level requirements, then software and hardware requirements. But look, we have to show that there's a feedback loop. See that, isn't that neat? That's the feedback loop. We have to prove continuously that we have that feedback loop, okay? Software, hardware, continuously, safety and systems are involved. Now that safety, this is not a safety assessment course. If you want more information on safety assessment, visit the Effusion website, one of the chapters to our next book that's publicly available free for free download on Effusion is a detailed safety assessment white paper. Establish a criticality level, Iterate the architectural definition, the actual design of the system. Then identify the failures, potential failures. Perform a functional hazard assessment, that's system centric. Then a preliminary system safety assessment, it's architecture centric. And then bottom to top, evaluating each component, 
what's the mean time between failure? Do we need a failure mode effect analysis, bottom to top? So we've got top to bottom, FHA, PSSA, bottom to top, SSA. It looks like this. We've got avionics requirements that we decompose from the customer, our own companies, proprietary features, our secret sauce, you might say. Then we've got regulatory requirements, safety requirements. Then software on the left and us for this webinar, hardware. First, the hardware requirements. Note there's only one level of hardware requirements, unlike software DL178 with two levels. However, we, hardware, have two levels of design, unlike software, which has one. Hardware, conceptual design, detail design. You saw that up before, several slides ago. Conceptual design. What does the external I.O. of that hardware look like? Detail design. How about the implementation? Are we ready to write logic? Now, verification. We're leading to DO160. More testing. But first, the verification equation. Verification equals R plus T and A. Reviews. Everything gets reviewed. Tests. Two things. The hardware requirements and the hardware implementation. What can't be fully determined by reviews and tests has further analysis. Now, hardware verification, this is at the hardware level, not the system environmental testing level that Patrick's going to talk about. We've got tests, hardware requirements-based testing, logic testing. We've got requirements, conceptual detail design, logic. We need requirements-based test results. We don't just execute the logic. That's not testing. That's execution. Instead, we define a priori, Latin, in advance. What should the expected result of that logic be? Based on requirements, then execute. Does the implementation, execution, runtime, do those results meet the requirements? Then low-level test results review for the actual design and implementation, looking at every line of logic, every branch, in some cases, MCDC. So that's for level A and B. Then analysis of traceability, requirements coverage. Did we cover all the low-level tests? Structural coverage for level A and B. For level A, B, C, static timing, device usage, thermal power, and finally, pin coverage analysis. Have I individually transitioned to each pin through all its possible transitions? Now, a logic review. We don't just hold the logic in our hand, look at it, and say, yep, it feels right. No, no. Hardware logic reviews, engineers are required to use all six of these inputs. Okay, logic, checklist, standard, the actual design, the hardware requirements, but which requirements? That's the trace matrix. We use those six inputs, all under configuration control, to complete the corresponding checklist. If you need a sample checklist, just contact a Fusion. If you need the whole set, we do sell those to our customer. Jeff can uh, connect you with those. Now, you also then need to identify action items and defects. That's the transition. Engineers follow the transition. Process assurance confirms it via audits. A best practice. While this is not required, think about it. This is the typical, traditional DO254 engineering sequence. Write requirements, review them. Develop design, review it. Write the logic, review it. Write test cases, execute test cases, review. Well, that's traditional, but it's very inefficient if the requirements aren't great. What's the best way to review requirements? By writing the test cases. Move the hardware test cases, their review, as part of the hardware requirements review. Review those requirements by writing the test cases. You see that? That's a better way. Get that design right before you implement it. Now, finally, we need checklists. This is the last slide before I turn it over to Patrick. Guilty until proven innocent. Just like your expense reports need receipts, DO254 needs receipts. Those receipts are checklists. This is a cut and paste of one of our proprietary checklists. Again, we have a full set, a couple dozen checklists from a Fusion. They're all new and very thorough. They've been approved and used on many EASA. FAA projects. All plans, standards, requirements, design tests, everything needs a checklist. Okay, so with that, 
I'd like to turn it over to Patrick from Aerospace Pal, our partner and a terrific source of DL160 expertise. Patrick? Thanks, Vance. Uh, thanks for the overview on DO254 and some of your insights. Uh, here we'll just look at the DO254 um, design life cycle and how it transitions to DO160. Again, just in review, we have the planning phase up top, requirements capture phase going from left to right, conceptual design, detailed design, implementation, and pr production transition. If we look at the next slide, you can see that in the planning phase, go ahead to the next slide, Vance. You can see at the planning phase, we'll typically have a gating planning review. We'll, you'll be reviewing all your planning documents that Vance talked about earlier. In the requirements capture phase and your requirements review, this is when you wanna have your D160 qualification test plan reviewed and signed off. Your test plan should be no more than 10 pages long. It's really a simple document. Uh, the most important sections are your system overview, where you talk about your LRU, your line replaceable unit, and how it functions with the aircraft, as well as your qualification table. These are the requirements that you're gonna test to in DO160. You'll be marking in this sample table, each section and how you'll test, analyze, or qualify qualification by similarity. If we go on to the next slide, conceptual design usually holds your gating preliminary design review or PDR, followed by your detailed design phase, which holds your CDR or critical design review. In your CDR, this is when you need to have your D160 qualification test procedure. These are detailed requirements that are flushed out from your qualification test plan. It will include location of tests, the cable harnesses that you'll be using, the EUT configuration, possible modes that you'll be testing to, and step-by-step -step procedure of D160. A lot of test engineers regurgitate all the steps that are in D160, which makes for a long and hard to read qualification test procedure. Whenever possible, reference D160 rather than repeating all the verbiage. Going on to the next slide. After you've done your qualification test procedure, you're going to go into your implementation phase where you're going to be building your actual qualification EUT or equipment under test. You'll be performing your D160 testing and hopefully successfully passing all the requirements in D160. After passing the test, you'll be writing your qualification test report, which will be a repeat of your qualification test procedure, but with the actual test performed. If you have deviations, this will be, this will be written in your qualification test report and hopefully signed off and communicated with your, your aircraft partners. The results and analysis will also be included in your qualification test procedure. And following that, you'll have a transition to the production phase. Now, a little bit about D160 in the next slide. It's a document with a series of minimum standard environmental test conditions. And it really provides the laboratory means for determining the performance characteristics. Lastly, it ensures a significant degree of competence for your certification authorities, your aircraft manufacturers. Going on to the next slide, we'll be looking at D160 electrical sections. This includes magnetic effect, power input, voltage spike, audio frequency susceptibility, induced signal susceptibility, RF susceptibility, RF emissions, lightning induced transient susceptibility, direct lightning effects, and ESD or electrostatic discharge. Going on the next slide, magnetic effect is a test to ensure the location of your EUT or line replaceable unit. 
This is a, these categories are based on how close your equipment can come to compass or compass sensors located on the aircraft, looking for a deflection of one degree in the compass. This is really more of a category than it is a test. Going on to the next slide is power input. Section 16. This is the longest section of DO-160 and can be quite cumbersome, especially if you're testing a uh, AC power supplied EUT. It provides categories for 14 volt, 28 volt, and 270 volt DC equipment, or if you have AC equipment, 115 volt or 230 volt AC equipment. Next slide, we look at the categories themselves. And it really depends on what kind of power you're getting. AC is breaking down, broken down into center, narrow, and wide frequency, and can have additional requirements, including harmonics, current modulation, power factor, and inrush. Your DC equipment or DC line replaceable units are based on the power, again, being provided to your equipment, whether it's from transformer rectified units, DC supplies with significant battery capacitance if you're running off a 270 volt DC equipment or section Z, DC without significant battery capacitance. If you're subject to section C, Z, you won't have under voltage requirements or engine startup requirements, but you'll have significantly more ripple in your audio frequency. Additional test requirements can be leveraged R ripple current and I inrush current. Looking at power input a little bit more deeply, on the next slide, we have the failures that can occur. I see most of the failures occurring in normal abnormal voltage, momentary power interrupts, normal or abnormal surge voltages, under voltages, including engine starting under voltage or momentary under voltage and current in rush. One thing to note, the most failed test is probably abnormal surge voltage. This is where your power inputs can go in, let's say a 28 volt system up to 80 volts for a period of time, for 100 microseconds in fact. Oftentimes people use TVSs to shunt that current and clamp it. However, TVSs are not only are not rated for that duration. Here you can see on the right, there's a peak pulse power curve rating for a TVS. You can see it only goes to one millisecond. However, abnormal surges go for 100 milliseconds or even a second. This TVS is not rated and should be at a high enough working voltage to pass that abnormal and normal surge through to a different protection device, such as an active clamp. Another time, another test that is often failed is current inrush. However, usually this is not a design issue. Sometimes it's a test issue. In the simulation shown below, you can see three different current inrush results, with two of them being over the red limit line. This is due to the power input rise time that's seen on the equipment. The test standard allows for 300 microseconds. These are three different results showing a one microsecond rise time, a 10 microsecond rise time, and a 100 microsecond rise time, all within the requirements of DO160. However, the last one passes. Make sure that your power input has a rise time not too fast, but meeting the spec of 300 microseconds. Going to the next slide, voltage spike, section 17, determines whether your equipment can handle spikes arriving on its power inputs or power leads. Breaks down into two categories. Section A, which is a 600 volt spike at 10 microseconds, or section B, two times your line voltage or 200 volts at 10 microseconds. The key here is that it lasts for 10 microseconds which is actually a pretty short amount of time. And the pulse generator has a source impedance of 50 ohms, which is quite large. This test is gonna be less severe than 
Section 22, induced lightning, which we'll talk about later, and doesn't need to be analyzed by itself. Going to the next slide, Section 18, audio frequency susceptibility. This, like voltage spike, is on your power lines and depends on the power input to your, your unit under test. You'll notice similar categories to Section 16 power input with center frequency, narrow frequency, and wide frequency for AC, as well as depending on how the DC power gets to your unit, categories R, B, Z, and K. Audio frequency is typically less severe than section 20, which we'll talk about later, RF susceptibility. And again, shouldn't need to be analyzed individually. Looking at section 18, audio frequency susceptibility on the next slide, you can see that an audio generator uses a transformer to couple voltage onto your lines. If you look at the graph carefully on the left, for example, a 28 volt DC will have a maximum four volts peak to peak. Again, this is less severe than your, even your indirect lightning, which is in section 22. Going to your next slide, section 19, we talk about induced signal susceptibility. This test is meant to simulate lines that are closely run together. You know those long cable runs in aircrafts where you have different equipment routed right next to each other? This is meant to look at the induced voltages and currents and the transients that can be generated from one line to another. If you talk to testing houses that specialize in VO160, they'll let you know that hardly anybody fails these tests. These are pretty benign levels in reference to what you might see in section 20 RF susceptibility, which is our next slide. Section 20 RF susceptibility is definitely a critical section with, it, with the conducted susceptibility being induced on your cable starting at 10 kilohertz and going all the way up to 400 megahertz and the irradiated susceptibility overlapping starting at 100 megahertz going up to 18 gigahertz. On the next side, if you look at the test setups for section 20, you can see on the left-hand side, we have an antenna that is radiating noise onto our equipment. If you have a metal enclosure or a Faraday cage, you'll be looking at the noise coming in through the connectors or the aperture holes in your, in your Faraday cage, as well as coupling onto your lines. Now, remember, I said it started at 10 megahertz and goes up to 18 gigahertz. If you have a good Faraday cage, typically you won't see any failures above two to four gigahertz, and the rest will be pretty benign. It's, if you don't have a Faraday cage and you have a plastic housing, really what you're trying to do is minimize your loop area. And you can learn all about loop area at Aerospace Pals website. Essentially what it is, is how close your signal traces are to their reference plane. A lot of times people will talk about ground planes shielding your units. And really what they're talking about is the loop area between the trace and the ground plane. And that's critical. The other thing that's critical is the noise and returning it to the source. I can't stress that enough. If noise gets coupled onto your line, such as on the right-hand side, Conducted, suscept conducted susceptibility, you want that noise to not go into your box. You want to escape from your box immediately. And that's where filters immediately at the connector help. They return the noise to the source, which is chassis. You want to let that noise run out of your box almost instantaneously. Next slide, we talk about Section 21, RF emissions. Again, there's two portions of this. Conducted emission at 150 kilohertz and going all the way up to 152 megahertz with a, a slight overlap of radiated emissions starting at 100 megahertz going up to 
six gigahertz or two or six thousand megahertz. Uh, the different levels basically depend on how close you are to other sensitive electronics, such as um, radio antennas or GPS antennas. The the categories range from B, L, M, H, P, and P and Q are the most severe. Looking at the next slide, we look at the test setups again. And these will be awfully familiar. They're basically radiator conducted susceptibility, but in reverse. Now we're looking at the noise generated from your unit. Um, in radiated, most often, if you have a Faraday cage again, it'll be noise coming out of the lines radiating on the lines themselves to the antenna. And conducted is directly measuring the lines and will be, you'll have a, a conducted test for each bundle that you have. Again, returning the noise to the source is the key, but the difference here is the source is very different. The source, instead of being external and relative to chassis, you have an internal source. So a lot of times, clocks, switch mode power supplies, um, motor drivers will be your sources. I encourage you, if you have a noise issue, to try and solve it at the source rather than the connector. The connector really, the filtering of the connector should always be considered a last resort. Going on to section 22, indirect lightning. This is the probably the most failed test, and it's the most severe test in DO160 for electrical sections. It allows you to simulate and test what kind of lightning transients you'll see or could see during a lightning event. Now remember, the direct lightning effect happens on the skin of the aircraft and runs down the skin of the aircraft. And this is the voltage or current that can be induced onto your cables. So the section breaks down into pin injection, cable bundle tests, which include single and multiple stroke, as well as multiple burst. And the levels range from one to five, one being the easiest, and five being the most stringent and hardest test. Now looking at an example on the next slide, here we have B4, G3, L3. Now this is the most recent revision of REV-G. Um, previous REVs uh, structured a little bit differently, but we'll look at the most recent version. So B4, equals your pin injection waveform set and level. And your cable bundle is G3, the middle two characters, whereas your last characters define your multiple burst level. If you look at this example, uh, if we just go next, we can see B4 breaks down on this pin injection table, B being the waveform set, which comes into test waveforms three and five A. Now, if we look at four, our level, and we look at our waveform three and five A, we can see that waveform three applies 1500 volts and 60 amps, whereas waveform five A applies 750 volts, 700 amps. And you might wonder, well, what's worst case? Well, in this, if you look at the actual waveforms, Waveform 5A will be worst case because of the long duration that it has. And it can be often considered worst case for all of section 22. We'll take a look at an example on the next slide. Here we have an aerospace PAL tool that can be found on the website. And I'll email this out to every participant if they want to quick download it. Essentially, it's an analyzer to help you solve your pin injection waveform set. Usually you'll be protecting with the TDS on the right-hand side, which is shown, and your transient generator is on the left-hand side. Now, if you just fill in all the boxes in blue, it'll tell you uh, your output requirement. Here we're gonna do waveform 5A, just like our level, 750 volts and 750 amps, and that's our B4 requirement. It'll generate a, a resistance of one ohm that's built in, and then you tell it 
what resistance you have in your EUT. So for example, we'll do 10 ohms uh, resistance, and that might be a discrete output that we're testing. Here you can see with an SMCJ33A with one in, one in series, we have a peak pulse power that's awfully close to the rated power of the TBS. So it's highlighted in yellow. Usually you want at least 20% margin. Now, all you have to do in this tool is simply select a few part numbers and see what kind of part will pass the requirement. Here I preloaded tons of TBSs, over 400 TBSs, from SMAJ to GJ to 30 KPA. Here we need a little bit more power, so we'll be looking at the SMDJ, and we'll be looking at a 33 volt SMDJ. So all you have to do is click SMDJ, it reruns the power calculations, and you can see that now your TDS can survive and you have a passing level. It also gives additional information like your max clamping voltage and your minimum breakdown voltage, or, which are handy in analyzing whether downstream products will be protected with this TBS. And again, I'll email that out uh, for anybody who wants to download it um, on an email following this. Going on to section 23 on the next slide, direct lightning. So we talked about indirect lightning or induced lightning. This is for externally mounted products. Uh, this is a lightning strike directly on your product, which can melt your product. Now you're not op you're not um, required to operate during this test, and it's really a damage test that looks at what kind of voltages or currents will be induced on your lines. With the high voltage strike attachment test, uh, the picture on the left determining where the lightning strike would typically couple to, and then the high current physical damage test, which you typically monitor your open circuit voltage as shown on the right. Sometimes uh, equipment manu or aircraft manufacturers will want to see the, the current as well. And then not last, section 25 on the next slide, ESD or electrostatic discharge. Here we're going to look at how your airborne equipment can handle ESD events from human contact. This is a 15 kilovolt ESD event, but it's limited in many ways. It has only 150 picofarad capacitance and 330 ohms in series. Again, this, because of the series impedance, is less severe from a damage standpoint than indirect lightning. Any events from ESD that might cause a product to fail are similar to susceptibility, in particular radiated susceptibility events, where that induced voltage might couple onto your lines or your internal product itself. And if we look at the next side, here we're talking about the summary of DO160. What do you need to focus your intention on, attention on? Really, I wanna say focus on the big four, which are power input, RF susceptibility, RF emissions, and lightning-induced transient susceptibility. With the keys on these four sections are all pretty similar. The big takeaways are return the noise to the source. If that source is internal and it's a clock, make sure that you have proper decoupling. If it's a switch mode power supply, make sure your current loops are really small. And also protect the EUT at the connector, whether that's a lightning event or protecting it from RF susceptibility. And with that, I'll pass it back to Vance and he'll have the answers for that quiz you've been waiting for. Patrick, thank you very much. That was a terrific, terrific explanation. Folks, that was Patrick at Aerospace Pals, a true expert in DO160 testing. Now, here we are. You're ready for that quiz. Let's see what we have. You ready? Number one, DAL C in 254 is similar to DAL C in 178. That's false. Okay. DAL C is mostly black box in 254. It's white box fully in 178. Now, look at the next one. DO160 has different testing for complex versus. No, no, no. DO160 
is LRU-based environmental testing. We don't look at the actual complex versus simple hardware. That's part of 254, where we delve into the complex hardware itself. That's a false. Number three, DAL-A, complex electronics hardware, CEH, is often 10% or more expensive than DAL-B. Interesting. They're actually the same. Okay, sometimes we might apply MCDC, especially with EASA, SWCH, CMO01. But the real added expense of level A, and it is much more, is in the redundancy that's often applied, mandatory almost, for DAL A, less so for B. Number four, 254 provides a concise definition of complex versus simple. No, it does not. But if you delve onto the FAA EASA websites, you will see that Hardware is simple only if a comprehensive set of full I.O. tests showing all possible inputs, outputs, paths to inputs to outputs have been verified and you have traceability to prove that. Guilty until proven innocent. So that would be false. Number five, hardware testing for DO254 must be repeated for DO160 tests. No, no, no. This is an industry standard. We don't like wasting money in industry. Number six, hardware synthesis placement route tools are usually qualified. No, they're not. They are not because their outputs are verified, okay, where we fully verify the outputs by other means. Remember, reviews, test analysis, we don't have to qualify. So I wonder how many of you all got all the answers right to that. Well, it looks like we have a number of questions, and we've got just a couple minutes to answer those questions, okay? When you have questions, just email us here, infodiffusion.com or patrick at Aerospace Pal, and we'll get back to you with those, okay? So looks like we've got a couple questions here. Let's go ahead and take a look. The first question is DO160 based. Patrick, why don't you take this one? How do you protect against DO160 conducted susceptibility injected directly on the EUT wires. Okay. Um, yeah, so this gets back to what I talked about earlier, being the key is to return the current directly back to the source. Um, typically, if your unit includes a chassis, you're gonna want capacitive filtering right to that chassis. If you have low frequency noise issues, that's gonna be larger capacitance. So let's say a 0.1 microfarad will handle that low frequency uh, that low frequency noise, whereas a higher frequency noise can be filtered out with a smaller capacitance. And then last but not least, you want to have series resistance whenever possible. Not only does that reduce the amount of noise coming in, but it also helps your TVSs handle more power when you get to section 22. Very good. Thank you, Patrick. The next question looks like a 254 question. It is, while you were speaking, I looked at the Fusion website on gap analysis. Good info, but it didn't tell me what the most common gaps were. Could you please tell me? Okay, I think there's a video that explains that, but real quick, it's a great question. First, probably the lack of detail in hardware requirements is profound. If you look at our requirements standard template and checklist, it goes into a lot of detail, all the areas of hardware requirements that are necessary. Things like built-in test, the switchover, the power up, that, as Patrick mentioned, is generally a, a large gap. I think there's often a gap between the conceptual and detailed design phase. Remember, we have to show that we had conceptual design, we reviewed it, and then that we, after that, transition to the detailed design, okay? Now, if we're level A and B, we need standards for that as well, so that's almost always a gap. Oh, there's several more, but probably the bigger ones are tool qualification missing, and of course, proof of structural coverage, okay? So we have some tools for that. Now, I will say that typically, the lack of quality reviews is a real key missing area within 254. We have to prove that we had reviews. Reviews mean we had known inputs ahead of time that we assessed the item to. So we need those standards and checklists and really need to know what we're doing. Remember folks, testing is not the same as executing. Just because we executed something, we don't get credit for it. We have to prove that that something that logic, that hardware actually met its requirements. So testing is verification of fulfillment of requirements, okay? 
Let's see, next question, looks like a Patrick question. Uh, D0160 testing facilities are expensive, well that's for sure. Are there any D0160 testing that can be done at a low cost? Yeah, um, yeah, that definitely makes sense. D0160 test facilities can get quite expensive, ranging from uh, $250 an hour, you can get down to $150 an hour, but that can make a pretty extreme uh, cost on the budget. Um, I would say that most certification authorities will not really allow you to test uh, some of the EMC sections of the one 60 uh, with the exception of something a little bit more simple like power input. I've seen power input um, done in-house uh, at a supplier's uh, testing facility, and you can get power supplies that actually are pre-programmed to do a lot of the D160 sections, uh, like uh, California In Instruments uh, has a, a line of products there. Uh, the other thing you can do is run pre-qual tests. So you want to minimize your risk in uh, D160. So you can run some testing, even though it's not for certification, but it, it's an initial checkout of your unit. And I would say conductive the emissions would be the one to go for there. It's uh, relatively low cost. Uh, you just need a spectrum analyzer. Uh, you're going to want to build a copper aluminum bench and have a current probe. And you can get all that for under $5,000. Uh, if you look at some spectrum analyzers like uh, the Regal DSA 815 is what I have with a, um, a COM power current probe. Uh, that can be done at pretty low cost. And you can get a good idea of what your conducted emissions are, which also translates in the lower frequency range to what you'll see for radiated emissions. So you can get a really good snapshot of how you'll be how you'll perform during D160 testing. Very good. Thank you, Patrick. Folks, there's a, another few more questions, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. You've got Patrick's Aerospace Pal website, our Fusion website. You'll find a lot of free. Uh, information on those websites. So thank you very much for tuning in. This is uh, one of a series of many ongoing educational free webinars that we're doing, and we truly thank our friend Patrick at Aerospace Pals for joining a fusion. Everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.